Hey, let's get started. Welcome to Ash Wednesday Calculus. Um, we have a uh, quiz that was due, uh, it was due tonight. Um, um, about three-fourths of y'all have worked on it, so it, that's not bad. Um, the... Um, but uh, I didn't want y'all cursing or something on Ash Wednesday, so I moved that due date back a little bit, okay, um, to tomorrow night. So it's really due uh, tomorrow at midnight uh, instead of tonight at midnight, so you have a little bit of extra time uh, to work on that uh, pretty short quiz. So um, it's a little bit different than the homeworks, right? So you can expect uh, maybe the scores to be a little bit lower so that's to be expected but of course you want to do the best that you can right to try to keep your quiz score up and um, and help you prepare for that first test which is going which is coming up a couple of weeks from today um, I'm working on a uh, practice test for you um, and uh, I was hoping to have it finished by today but I've still got to um, insert a few problems because I'm trying to remember exactly what's in the homeworks uh, so I can um, uh, mimic uh, what's been in the homework so far. Plus, I'm a little bit not sure exactly where we're going to end up uh, by the time of the test, so I'm trying to guess that too. But um, I'll have that done shortly, so um, um, as soon as I get it ready, uh, I will send you an email. Uh, that it's posted on the, uh, it'll be posted on the Blackboard page. There's a section there for practice tests, okay? So that is, again, something else for you to use to help you prepare for uh, that test uh, in a couple of weeks. And we'll go over uh, in class, not the whole thing, but some of the uh, practice test problems uh, leading up to the test. And then um, John will also, can also use that to help uh, you in preparing for the uh, test um, on the um, uh, uh, during the uh, tutoring sessions, okay, uh, that he conducts. Uh, so you can see my grade really stinks there. Wow. Okay. So I got to really get to work, don't I? Seven point seven seven. But um, uh, but everyone else's grade is pretty good. So you've been doing pretty good on the homework. So I'm very pleased with that. So that's excellent. So I hope you can keep that up. I know there's a lot of Assignments coming up due, so and I'm sensitive to that. So I'm I'm trying to be um, uh, keep them short and um, and trying to space out the due dates uh, as best I can. Um, but yeah, it'll be a pretty regular, as I mentioned last time, schedule. Um, you know, through the end of the semester. Okay, so um, so we you know we do have some work there that we have to do right um, to get prepared for the tests and. Um, and um, uh, uh, learn what we need to learn here this semester um, about calculus, okay? All right, so uh, do you all have any questions? Uh, so the home uh, homeworks before the quiz are done, are there any quiz questions there that uh, are occurring to anyone um, that you want to ask about? Was that on the quiz? Yeah, I was trying so hard. I just couldn't remember that. I'm just curious. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. I haven't thought about it. How to explain? Is that that's my answer? Should still be still be in there, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I haven't thought about how exactly how to explain that. Uh, of course, I missed it the first time, so. Um, so I had to submit it twice uh, on that one. So we did figure out this one, that it was going to take 13.751 years after the end of 2000. Okay. So if we just counted off, uh, we realized that 13 years from the end of 2000, just, just 13 years from the end of 2000, would lead us to the end of 2013. Okay, right? Okay, so that would bring us all the way to the end of 2013. And, but then we have to deal with that 0.751 uh, 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 that we have also as part of the answer, right? Okay, so we have to figure out how to account for that fraction, 
All right. And so I would say on a test, you know, you could say, okay, that's going to be sometime during 2014. Right. Okay. And that would be fine for a test. But here they're, you know, being very specific. Right. Because um, this is a computer graded system. So they have to have specific answers to grade them. Right. Can't, you can't say, you know, oh, sometime in 2014. Right. Um, so I can grade that on a test. But that's much harder for the computer to understand that sort of. Uh, vagueness, all right. So here's uh, 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 how I thought of it. So there, there are 12 months in the year, right? Okay. So I just took uh, that 0. 0.751 and just multiplied that by the 12 months, okay? All right. So um, since they're asking us for what month, um, <clears throat> and so uh, let's see, what is 0. 0.751 times 12? What, 9.012, okay? So when I first looked at that, I, I ignored the decimal part here and said, okay, that's going to be in the ninth month, which is September. Uh, and so I got it wrong the first time, all right? But if we actually take into account that 0 0.012, that's going to put us just a little bit into the 10th month, okay? Just a little bit into the 10th month. Um, not a full 10 months, right, but just a little bit into the 10th month. So that's how I eventually decided, okay, yeah, their answer is right, that it really is October of uh, 2014. Does that make more sense? Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, so the years, that's right, because 13 years, since we started from the end of 2000, 13 years, just the 13 years would bring us to the end of 2013, and then the .751 makes us bleed into... 2014 that just a little over nine months okay so it would be right at the beginning of October actually that would really be October 1st right right at the beginning of October uh, is if we just want to answer this super carefully uh, like they want on the homework all right okay okay so as I pointed out um, on a test I might expect you to come up with this answer but uh, you know, it's going to take, you know, 13.751 years, but that sort of precision is not usually something I'm going to ask for on a test. All right. Okay. But I know you want your points. So, <laughs> so all right. So that's how it, uh, that's how it came about. So um, uh, on your version of the quiz, you're going to get a different, slightly different um, uh, amount here for the population, I guess. And so, um, you, you, so you might have to compute this slightly differently. All right. Okay. Uh, but that's the idea. All right. Other questions? There's, uh, oh, the next question. Now, this, uh, um, we haven't talked about this, but um, um, any trouble there with uh, uh, interpreting negative exponents or fractional exponents? This is something that turns out to be important in calculus. And... Um, Something that turns out to be important in calculus, and students often forget this because it's not intuitive. So it's something that you just have to memorize, okay? And I know you've seen it before, so this is just to remind you, uh, 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 since the last time you've seen it, how you interpret negative and uh, it, not given in this problem, but fractional exponents. So if you want to simplify 5 to the minus 1, um, so it says uh, express the following numbers without using exponents, all right? Then uh, you have to remember, you know, uh, gosh, what does it mean to raise a quantity to the minus one power, all right? And it's uh, the, the, what the rule that you need to remember is negative exponents always tell you to invert, okay? So 5 to the minus one power means 1 over 5 to the first power. OK, that's what negative exponents indicate. OK, so you're always going to take the reciprocal. So whenever you see a negative exponent, just think, oh, yeah, OK, I'm going to take the reciprocal. OK, so 5 to the minus 1 is the same as 1 over 5 to the first power. And of course, that's easy. That's just 1 fifth. OK, so uh, 5 to the minus 3, right? That's uh, once you've seen this, then this is equally easy. All right, that means 1, 5 to the minus th uh, uh, 3 means 1 over 5 cubed. And then, of course, you can cube 5, and I think that's 125, right? So this is um, 1 over 125, okay? So if you've forgotten that, that's just something you're, you're, 
again, that's something you're just going to have to memorize because it's not intuitive why negative exponents work the way they do. There is a reason for it, okay? It wasn't just invented out of thin air. There's good logic behind it, but you're not going to remember the logic behind it, so you're just going to have to remember um, how to interpret negative exponents. So if you have one-fifth, on the other hand, to the minus one power, uh, still, that means take the reciprocal. So this is the same as five over one to the positive one power. Okay, right? Take the reciprocal of the quantity that's raised to the base, the quantity that's raised to the power. So, and of course, 5 over 1 is just 5, and to the first power is just 5. Okay, so that just simplifies to 5. Or if you see something like 1 over 5 to the minus 3, again, just remember, take the reciprocal. So this means 5 over 3 to the first power, see? Okay, take the reciprocal and change the sign of the exponent. I forgot to say take the reciprocal and change the sign of the exponent. So 1 over 5 to the minus uh, 3 is uh, f 5 cubed over 1, all right? And, of course, you don't have to worry about dividing by 1, and all you have to do is cube 5, and, again, that's 125, okay? So that's important uh, rules to remember because these are going to come back. Uh, uh, we're going to see these again. Uh, later on in calculus, uh, negative exponents show up uh, frequently when you're doing uh, 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 various types of calculations, various types of computations in calculus. All right, and if you don't remember the, what negative exponents mean, then you know it really drive you crazy. Okay, uh, so that's why that problem is inserted in the homework and in the quiz, just to make sure that you have recalled that. Another uh, 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 type of exponent that shows up in um, uh, calculus is fractional exponents, okay? And those often uh, also drive students crazy, okay? So uh, if you're, for instance, wanting to compute uh, 25 to the 3 halves power, okay? Again, it's not intuitive to think, you know, what does it mean to raise a quantity to the 3 halves power? If you have 25 cubed, that's easy, right? That's intuitive, easy to remember. That means 25 times 25 times 25, right? But intuitively, what does it mean to raise a number to the 3 halves power? So again, this is just something you have to uh, uh, remember, okay? Uh, you just have to learn, uh, uh, memorize this and uh, just keep this in the back of your mind, okay? So when you raise a, a, a base to a fractional power, all right, uh, that indicates a root, a radical, all right? And the denominator of the fractional power tells you the index of the radical, the type of radical. So 25 to the 3 halves power means the square root, the square root, I'm not, I can, I can leave the 2 off since this is square root, but it, uh, uh, that denominator becomes the index of the radical, okay? And then the numerator of the fraction just remains as an exponent. So 25 to the 3 halves power means the square root of 25 cubed. Of course, for square root, you usually don't write the index there. That's understood. So um, that's what 25 to the 3 halves power means. Okay, And um, you can actually write the um, exponent uh, either outside of the radical or inside of the radical. So you could also write this as the square root of the quantity 25 cubed, but usually it's easier uh, uh, to, the, and these should uh, compute the same way. There are some instances where they don't, but normally they will uh, uh, simplify exactly to exactly the same amount. Um, but it's usually easier to com uh, compute the radical first and then raise to a power. See, because here you're going to have to take uh, 25 and cube it. That's going to give you a big number, and then you're going to have to figure out what the square root of that is, right? But uh, here, it's much easier to think, oh, I, uh, what's the square root of 25? Oh, that's easy to calculate, right? What's the square root of 25? 5, right? And then worry about cubing the 5, and we just did that a moment ago, right? So that uh, simplifies to just 125, okay? Now, you can uh, combine... Okay, uh, fractional exponents and negative exponents. So, for instance, you could see a nasty expression like this, and you will, okay, uh, later on in the course, all right, something like 16 to the minus 5 fourths power. So you're scratching your head thinking, what in the world could 16 to the minus 5 fourths power really mean, okay? And the idea is very simple. Uh, these uh, exponents are, these fractional exponents are just another way of expressing 
uh, roots, okay? Just another way of expressing roots, okay? And remember, the negative exponent just indicates a reciprocal. So here's how I would do this. I would take care of the negative exponent first to get rid of the negative, okay? So that means invert, right? So you have 1 over 16 to the positive 5 fourths power, okay? All right, well, that's still a pretty uh, ugly expression to simplify because you still have to deal with you know, 16 to the 5 fourths power, right? But now you don't have the negative in the exponent. So get rid of the negative first by taking the reciprocal. Uh, negative exponent always means take the reciprocal, okay? Now, what does a 16 to the 5 fourths power mean? Don't forget this was uh, uh, in the denominator of the fraction, so it's easy to forget about the 1 over uh, when you're simplifying this. That's a common mistake. So don't do that. Uh, but what is 16 to the 5 fourths power? Well, okay, remember, okay, the 4 tells us the index of the root. So this is going to mean the fourth root, the fourth root of 16, and then all of that raised to the fifth power. So the 5 remains as an exponent, okay? 5 remains as an exponent. Well, let's see. Fourth root of 16. So hopefully I haven't given myself an impossible task here. What's the fourth root of 16? That's 2, yeah, okay? The 4th root of 16 is 2 because 2 to the 4th power, just check it, is 16, okay? So what we really have here is uh, 1 over 2 to the 5th power, and now we just have to worry about raising 2 to the 5th power. Not so bad, okay? That, uh, when you uh, use 2 as a factor 5 times, you get 32, okay? 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 32, okay? All right, so so 16 to the minus four, five, uh, 5 fourths power looks horrible, but it's really just 1 32nd, okay? This is another way of writing 1 over 32, okay? So uh, these negative and fractional exponents, not impossible. I know you've seen them before, okay? You've successfully uh, 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 simplified them before, but they're easy to uh, you know, forget what that means again because it's not intuitive, okay? So I'm just cautioning you, you just have to memorize what fractional and negative exponents mean, okay? You don't want to be scratching your head on the test thinking, oh gosh, what? You know, what was that all about, okay, right? Because, um, you know, you're not going to be able to invent the answer, okay? You have to have it memorized, all right? Now, there is a good reason, though, why uh, 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 raising a number to a fractional exponent uh, should simplify as a radical, okay? There is a, there is a logic behind that, okay? All right? It's not just, uh, 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 you know, made up out of thin air, okay? Uh, there's good reason for that. Okay, so... Uh, there's this that little review of negative and fractional exponents since we didn't get a chance to uh, talk about those. Okay, all right. So I think we're done talking about the quiz. I hope so. So I hope that's pretty easy. So, but the big difference is right. Oh, I think I can see it here on the quiz. Or one of the big differences, you have to um, submit the whole thing at once. Is that right? Yeah. So you can't go problem by problem. Uh, and submit the answers. You have to submit the whole assignment at once. So make sure that you, uh, uh, you know, complete the whole assignment right before you submit. Because I think the ones that you don't have submitted, it's going to count wrong if there's a blank there, right? Um, if I, huh? Yeah, for the quiz, right? Okay. Oh, it did? Okay. Oh, that's so, that's, okay. That was nicer than I meant to be, but, all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, let's, now let's look at the, um, now let's go back to our notes, okay? So, because we finally, oops, that's the wrong notes. Uh, we finally now have, um, we're finally getting close to getting into the fun stuff, the calculus. Here was the last example that we uh, were looking at last time. Um, this was about the uh, life expectancy of female high school dropouts. Remember that life expectancy is uh, falling, right? Okay. And so um, 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 in answering this question, right, um, we reminded ourselves that uh, 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 of the answer to this question over here in the margin, 
for a linear function, and this is a linear function because it fits the format of a linear function, right? Okay. Uh, uh, the uh, y-intercept here is 78, and the slope there is minus 0.22. And so we know for, a, for linear functions, the average rate of change, whenever you calculate the average rate of change, and that's the average rate of change from uh, uh, any input to any other input. It doesn't matter which two inputs you choose to calculate the average rate of change for. If it's a linear function, then the average rate of change always turns out to be the same as the what? So what fills in the blank here? The slope, yeah. That is a very, uh, seems like kind of an innocuous uh, fact, okay? But that turns out to be a key idea, believe it or not. That's a key idea in calculus, okay? That for a, a linear functions, the average rate of change is the same as the slope, okay? That is really one of the fundamental, uh, uh, that may be the fundamental idea, in fact, uh, that's going to underpin uh, what we're doing in calculus. So it seems like a really simple idea. It is a simple idea, okay? But it turns out to be a really crucial idea. And uh, here's the, uh, the answer to this second question is also really important. So it says, why do we say that for uh, uh, the slope is steady for straight lines? So why do we say that? And that's because it doesn't matter which two points uh, you use to calculate the slope. Okay, when you use the slope formula to calculate the slope, it doesn't matter which two points you pick on the line, you always get the same amount. Okay, you always get the same amount. Okay, so that's a great convenience for straight lines. You can, uh, if your teacher asks you, gives you a straight line and says, okay, calculate the slope of this straight line, you can pick any two points off of the line and calculate the slope, and you will always get the same quantity. Okay. Um, so that's why we say the slope for lines is steady because it doesn't matter uh, 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 where you're calculating the slope between which two inputs you're calculating the slope. You always get the same steady amount. Okay. Um, all right. So keep those two uh, 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 facts there uh, always in the back of your mind. Okay. Because they're going to be very important to us here, uh, especially in the first half of the course. All right. Now, however, let's now look at a function that is not, by any means, a linear function. Okay. So uh, this function, it does have a little bit of good news in it. It says uh, the following function shows the gel population y. We're measuring the gel population in millions because that's a large population. So we're going to measure the output here in millions so we don't have to deal with uh, super big numbers. Okay, uh, So this function gives the jail population, total jail population in the U.S., okay, uh, 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 a certain number of elapsed years, T elapsed years after 1900. Okay, So T elapsed years after 1900. And the first thing that we're asked there is, okay, what was the change in the jail population what was the change in the jail population from 1990 to 2015? Okay, so what was the change in the jail population? And then let's interpret that amount. That's pretty easy to interpret uh, the value that we get. Okay, so how do we calculate that change? Remember, uh, if this is not percent change or average rate of change. This is just straightforward change, right? And so if you look back in the notes, um, if you're given a function and you're asked to calculate uh, the change, um, remember you just take um, f of your last input, right? Okay. And, uh, well, let me spell it out here. So it's f of the last input minus f of the first input. Okay. So in this example, we're asked for the change from 1990 to 2015. So f of the last there is going to be f of uh, uh, 2015, right? Okay. But remember, we're measuring our uh, years in elapsed years, so we don't have to use a big uh, quantity like 2015, right? So what would I plug in here for my input? What would you say there? Uh, be careful. It's elapsed years from not 1990, but... 1900. So 2015 is how many elapsed years from 1900? Uh, 
150, right? Yeah, you got, got a little slow on me there. Okay, yeah, just take the 1900 after, you know, subtract it from the 2015, right? So that turns out to be 115, all right? And so it's the 115 that we're going to plug into that formula. Now, see, that's going to give us a, a formidable little bit of arithmetic there, right? Calculating f of 115 because... Um, well, that's just some arithmetic that we have to do there, right? Okay, but let, we'll worry about that in a second. Okay, let's write down the formula first. And then we're going to calculate um, F of uh, 1900. But remember, uh, we're converting our inputs to elapsed years, right? I'm sorry, F of 1990, but we're converting our input to elapsed years. So that would be F of 90. So to calculate F of 90, we have to plug 90 there in for T into this big, ugly uh, formula. Okay. Well, if you have a calculator now, uh, you can do that. That'll take you uh, a few seconds, depending on how uh, swift you are with your calculator. Um, let me go to um, – I've already typed this formula into Desmos, though, so I hope I typed it in correct. Okay. I think I got it right. Uh, I converted the T to X because – uh, 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 so I converted the input variable there from t to x because Desmos is used to dealing with the input variable of x, not t. All right. So to calculate actually f of 115, what I need to do is for x, substitute in for the x value there. If I can get to the x here, I need to substitute in 115, right? So let me backspace that x. Let me backspace that X, and I'm going to put in there the um, 115, all right, okay, where I saw the X. So I can make Desmos do the arithmetic for me if I can get to the right spot. So I'm going to plug in the, one, uh, the 115 there and the 115 there, right, and then here I'm going to plug in again the 115, don't, um, don't forget to put times 115 there, right? And, oh, so Desmos is so nice to me. There it gives me the result is uh, 7.41275, okay? Can you all remember that? 7.21475, okay? All right, so 7.21475. So there was the F of the 115. Did somebody get that on a calculator too? You got something else? No, just, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I think let's, let's check our arithmetic there. Does that look like the right expression? I think so. So um, if I plug the coefficients in there right, so I'm hoping that is correct, okay? Um, another way we can double check this, another way we can double check that is um, I happen to make a graph of this uh, function also. So let's look at the graph. And there's 115 on the graph. And if we go up there, yeah, it looks like it could be close to the, looks like it could be around 7, right? Okay. Because that's what I'm uh, expecting. Just a little bit above seven. All right. So, did you get something way different from seven? Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that sounds like um, that means 800 million people would be in jail, and I don't think there's quite that. We have a, quite a few people in jail, but not that many. All right. Okay. So, um, I'm thinking maybe we got it right here. 7.41. Oh, did I? Did I? Oh, oh, yay! Okay, so we got at least two. Did I did I write it down right? Seven point no. Okay, I didn't write it down though, right? So what was it again? Seven point four one two seven five. So I transpose some digits. Four one two seven five. All right, now let's try the f of. Um, now let's try the F of 1990. So I need to come back here now again, and let's plug in. Um, now let's plug in there. Instead of 115, let's erase the 115, and let's plug in there a 90.
And so that looks like 4.764, 4.764, okay? All right, so we're going to subtract off here 4.764, and that will give us that uh, change in the, that will give us the change in the uh, jail population, okay? All right, so what, did that, what does that turn out to be? Can you all do that subtraction for me? It's going to be 2 point something, right? So the 7.41275 minus the 4.764, try that. What would y'all get? Y'all scared to tell me? Someone has to tell me or we'll have to just stand here like a dummy. What? 8.75? Okay. All right, so 2.64875. You've got to get used to writing down lots of decimals, and the only reason is is because uh, often in the web assignment homework, right, remember it requires lots of decimals, okay? So don't be shy there about writing down um, uh, lots of decimals, okay? Um, all right, so there it is, 2.64875. So what's our interpretation of that? What is that telling us? Well, it's telling us, right, from 1990 to 2015, right, the jail population has, what, it's changed, but this is a positive number, so it's what, increased, right, okay, so it's increased, right, okay, by 2,648,750, okay, remember these outputs are measured in, uh, these outputs are measured in uh, millions, okay, so that's what that's telling us, from 1990, all right, to 2015, uh, we did have an increase in the uh, jail population, okay? Maybe I should say jail population because that's not just the population, all right? So the jail population increased by uh, this amount but converted to millions, all right? 2 million... 648,750. So if you want to convert that to millions, right, just multiply that 2.64875 times 1 million, and that's what it'll turn out to be, okay? So we did have an increase uh, in that, um, we did have an increase there uh, in the uh, jail population, right? So let's see, what was the percent change, okay? So what was that percentage change? to remind us of the percentage change there, right? So how do you calculate the percent change? You take the change, right, which was what? 2.64875, and what do you divide that by? So you've got to remember your percent change formula. So you take the change, there was the change that we calculated. What did you divide by in the numerator here? No, that's the average change, okay? So for percent change, you divide by the first, okay? You divide by uh, uh, the first value, all right? Which was what in our calculation? That was f of 90. So we have what? 4.764. So you divide here by the 4.764. All right, and then you want to convert that to a percentage, so multiply by 100%. So when you do that quotient and multiply by 100%, what do y'all get there? 55.5, or so let's round that off to a couple of decimal places. So that's 55.60, okay? Uh, percent all right so about 55.60 percent yeah that looks about right to me that's supposed to be a six there okay so what's our interpretation of that percent change okay well that is very similar to the change except you would say from 1990 to 2015 the gel population increased by not this number but what this percentage okay so the interpretation is very similar so from and but don't forget remember put from 1990 to 2015 
okay that's very important that you put the time period there so why do we know it's increased well because this is a positive percentage right okay so 55.60 percent all right so those are just um, basic questions now let's calculate the average rate of change all right let's calculate the average rate of change all right so how do you calculate the average rate of change for that time period well if this were a linear function that would be so easy right because what would you just write down there for a linear function the average rate of change is the same as what the slope right so for if this were a linear function you could just write down the slope correct okay but this is not a linear function far from it so here's a graph of that function okay and see that function no way is that linear right okay and in fact when you look at the graph uh, uh, you can see right uh, what's been happening roughly right uh, to the gel population at first this is starting from 1980 okay that's 80 elapsed years so at first the gel population was increasing right okay the gel population was increasing but now a happy thing has occurred I guess it's a happy thing all right so uh, right around just slightly before 2010 right so maybe around 2008 right okay uh, what happened to the gel population yeah it peaked out right so it reached a local maximum there right so I guess that's around 108 yeah the gel population reached a local maximum and for the past few years what's been happening to the gel population yeah it's been decreasing right okay so that's been decreasing because there's been some reform of well there's been less crime okay so the crime rate has dropped off okay uh, in recent years and there's also been some sentencing reform okay so um, uh, 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 people who in the past would have been uh, uh, sentenced to jail have been you know given probation or deferred adjudication or uh, uh, they, you know, they've been able to avoid jail time okay so the jail population in just recently all right has actually been decreasing uh, a little bit okay all right so uh, I guess that's happy news all right but the the uh, but what the graph really tells us it, very important is that uh, uh, the average rate of change of the del jail population has not been steady okay not been steady at all it's been uh, increasing uh, uh, for some time and then it's been decreasing for some time and it's been increasing uh, at different rates at different times okay so the average rate of change of the del gel population not steady okay this is not a straight line all right well let's calculate that average rate of change for this particular time interval for this particular time interval so again what is the uh, what's the formula for average rate of change remember it's going to be the change divided by what so this is what y'all were taught yeah the length of the interval right okay so this is what y'all were trying to tell me for a percent change okay and it is more important for you to remember this formula than the percent change formula because we're going to use this one a lot more all right so again what was the change we already calculated the change what was that two point what two point six four eight seven five and then divided by that uh, length of that interval so what is that time interval 25 right okay so that's pretty easy just 25 years and so what does that uh, work out to be then so help me with that 0 0.10595 okay all right does that sound right to y'all all right so what is that uh, a point one zero five nine five what is that telling us so what is the interpretation so I know y'all are thinking of the interpretation is just kind of being gravy here uh, once you've got the result but that's really important to me okay so when I'm asking this on a test um, I, I'm, I'm happy to see the result you've got to get that but I I'm not going to give you anywhere near full credit if you're not able to write down the interpretation so both things are really important so what is that interpretation of that average rate of change 
mean okay and once you've done it for one problem it's very similar for the other problems because you sort of follow the same uh, template all right so you'll say on average all right and it's important to start with on average because this ch this rate of change has not been steady okay this rate of change has not been steady so if you don't say on average you're giving a false impression okay of what has been happening so on average what from 1990 to um, 2015 right okay um, the jail population did it increase or did it decrease <coughs> what it actually increased right okay on average it increased because this is a positive number see this is a positive number all right so the jail population increased that's on average though increased by and now convert that number to millions just by multiplying it by a million so you have a hundred and five thousand and nine hundred and fifty when you convert that uh, to millions okay just multiply that by a million that gives you that okay and then you've got to top it off though with the last part that happened on uh, uh, that increase uh, was on average per year okay so each year all right between 1990 and 2015 on average the jail population increased by 105,950 okay but see that's what happened just on average that was not steady okay right because between 1990 and 2015 there's 1990 and 2015 what really did happen to the jail population at first it was doing what at first it was increasing but then it started doing what decreasing right okay so uh, uh, altogether it went up a little bit right okay on average but that was not a steady rate of change okay that was just what happened on average all right what that number 0 0.10595 measures though it does measure the slope of a line okay it measures the slope of this dotted line that I have drawn in here that connects these two points on the curve so this is the point for 1990 and this is the point that corresponds to 2015 if you draw that straight line that connects those two points on the curve this is the slope of that line okay so if the gel population had increased by a steady amount of 105,950 this is what the graph would look like okay but it didn't increase by a steady amount right okay at first it went up and then it went down so that's what the jail population curve actually looks like this is what it would have looked like if the increase had been steady okay it would have looked like this straight line okay that line there that connects those two points on the curve that is called the secant line all right so anytime you have a curve and you draw a straight line that connects two points on the curve that's called a secant line and it's a straight line so it has a slope okay and this average rate of change is the slope of that secant line okay <clears throat> so for this uh, a secant line if you calculate its slope you're going to get 0 0.10595 all right what's the y-intercept of this line I have no idea it's back over here somewhere right okay but I do know that its slope is 0 0.105 nine five okay <clears throat> so notice that okay so that that gives us you know when you read that sentence that does give you some information about the jail population right indeed it did increase from 1990 to 2015 and it increased on average by this amount but notice that information is very misleading right okay because someone reads that sentence and they're going to think oh yeah it was going up every year by 105,950 right but that's not what happened at all okay uh, at first it was increasing and then it was decreasing so you see for a, a, for, a, for a curve that's not a straight line the average rate of change does tell you something but it sometimes gives you misleading idea of what's happening to the curve okay so it is a way of measuring change 
but it's not a perfect way of measuring change, okay? It can be uh, 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 misleading, uh, like in this example. That's why we always have to hedge when we're giving an interpretation for the average rate of change. We always have to hedge and throw in terms like on average, okay, and from 1990 to 2015, okay, so that we can make it clear to the reader this is not exactly what happened, right? This is what happened just on average. All right, let's try that again for a different time interval, except I'm going to let you all do it, okay? All right, so let's find the average rate of change from 2007 to 2010. So I'm going to have to write that formula down for you all. I'll scroll back and show you the formula, all right? So we want the average rate of change, the, not the percent change, not the change, but you will have to calculate the change. Uh, we want the average rate of change from 2007 to 2010, all right? So let's remember that, 2007 to 2010. First, let me draw a picture of that average rate of change, okay? So let me draw a picture of that average rate of change. So when I say draw a picture of that average rate of change, what do I mean, okay? What I'm, when you calculate that average rate of change, you're going to be finding the slope of the secant line that connects the point above 107, all right, so y'all help me find 107, which is about right there, okay, to this point above 110, which is about, it's hard for me to see this when I'm looking down at it, about right there, okay. So you're going to find the slope of that secant line. Wow, that looks like it's almost what? What kind of line there? What do you call a flat line? <laughs> All lines are straight, okay? <laughs> but what do you call a flat one like this one? <laughs> yeah, constant or that's uh, uh, horizontal, okay? So that looks like a uh, horizontal line. If I, if I got my points in the right spot, I may not have got the points in the right spot there because I'm just eyeballing it. So that looks like a horizontal line. And what do we know about um, horizontal lines? Their slope. What's the slope of a horizontal line? Do you all remember this? What? Zero. So we're thinking that when we calculate that average rate of change, it's going to come out to be pretty close to zero. It may not be exactly zero. Probably couldn't expect it to get exactly zero, right? Okay. But we're going to think that it's going to be a really tiny number, right? It's going to be very close to zero. Might be a little bit negative, might be a little bit positive. I'm not really sure from looking at the picture, but it's going to be very close to uh, zero. Okay. All right. That's my intuition. All right, so let's see if we got that right. All right, so let me scroll back and uh, look at the formula so y'all can see the formula there, right? Okay, so in calculating that new average rate of change, right, in calculating that average rate of change, all right, let's see. So we have to calculate uh, F of 2010. So when you convert that to elapsed years, that's going to be what? What goes in the parentheses here? 110, right. That's 110 elapsed years minus F of 2007. How many elapsed years is that? 107. So you've got F of 110 minus F of 107, right? Okay. And then you divide that by the length of the interval. What was the length of the interval there? That's easy. That was just three, right? Because that was... 2007 to 2010. So can y'all look at that formula and, okay, you're going to have to work with your partner now really closely here to see if you can calculate F of 110 minus F of 107 because you got to plug the 110 in, you're going to get an ugly result. you got to plug 107 in, you're going to get an ugly result. Take the difference there and then divide by, well, the dividing by three is the easy part, okay? All right, it's calculating this change. Remember, that's the change, okay? It's calculating this change, that's the hard part. All right, so see if y'all can do that. Got to give y'all three minutes to do that, okay? So do give it your best shot there. We'll see how close y'all got there.
So just do your best to see if you can plug those numbers into that expression and do that with your calculator. This is good calculator practice. Because you're going to have some problems in the homeworks for sure. We're going to have to do something ugly like this. They won't all be super easy. that's going to make a difference. I'm not sure if that's the only thing, right? Yeah, I remember that's f of not 10 because I wasn't counting the last years from 1990. I was counting from 1900. So that's f of 110. So it's 110 that you're plugging into the formula. So it would have been nicer if it were 10, but it's 110. And then you're going to plug 107 into the formula, okay? That's 2007. Somebody want to volunteer an answer? Do you th that you, ha you think you sort you think you got it right? I, I, we'll, we'll, and then we'll 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 do it ourselves and see how close y'all got there. Gerard, what'd you come up with? Uh, two zero point one nine seven. Uh, two zero is that after you divided by three? Yeah. So you got what? Uh, two zero point. 197? 434? Okay, Gerard. That looks like a really big number, doesn't it? Okay? Because remember, that, uh, that average rate of change is the slope of that secant line, right? Is the slope of that secant line, and that secant line appeared to be really flat, right? Okay? So we were saying we thought that was close to zero, but a line with slope 20 is pretty steep. It doesn't have a slope close to zero. So that might be a clue to you, Gerard, that you need to recheck your calculations, right? Okay. All right. So there's some good uh, intuition there to keep in mind, right? Ooh, that just doesn't, cor uh, I don't think that corresponds to the picture. All right. Okay. So, but other, but other people are going to make that same mistake. Okay. And that's how you can sort of maybe see that maybe you got a mistake. Does someone else have a? Answer they think might seem more reasonable? Yeah, Zaman. So minus point zero zero five. Did you get any decimal places there? You just did three decimal places there? Okay. Well that's pretty close to that's pretty close to zero. Okay, so we got that part of it at least correct, right? All right. So uh, so Zaman thinks it's negative, which means the, the jail population fell a little bit, okay, between 2007 and 2010, but just a little bit, right, okay, because that's a small, uh, that's a pretty small number there, right, that's a pretty small, all right, let's check it now, okay, so let's get, um, let's get Desmos here, 
uh, uh, to help us do some of these um, help us do some of these calculations. All right. So again, first I'm going to plug in the um, uh, f of 110, right? Okay. So let me put in the 110 here. <laughs> oh, so that's pretty close to what he wrote, though, right? Isn't it, Balkis? Okay. So I got for f of 110, when I plugged 110 in there for the input, 8.132. Does that sound, uh, someone else get that? Oh, good. Okay. So that's comforting. 8.132. All right. And now let's try the, um, the 107. So that's really easy to plug in. All I have to do is change a couple of digits here, right? So put a 107 there, and a 107 there, and a 107 there. And now, ooh, very close, right? Uh, uh, Desmo says 8.147102, okay? So 8. One four seven one zero oh, two, and then all of that divided by three. So indeed, it is going to be negative. Okay, so you're right, Zaman. It is negative because this quantity is a little bit, just a little bit less than this one. Okay, so when y'all take that difference, eight point one three two minus eight point one four seven one zero oh, two, and divide by three, what does that turn out to be? Someone do that for me. Okay. So 8.132, and then divide by 8.147102, and then divide by 3. Tell me what you get there. Speak up there. Negative what? Negative 0 .005. Any decimal places? Negative 0 .005 what? Zero three four, ha, huh, Zaman, you're you're perfect there. Okay, there it is. All right. Okay. So that was the um, there was the average rate of change from 2007 to um, 2010. All right. So how do we interpret that? Okay. So what's our interpretation there? So again, you're going to start with on average, right? Because that's not a steady change okay that's not steady so that's just what it's happening on average from 2007 to 2010 all right uh, the jail population was it increasing or decreasing decreasing right yeah because that's a negative change so the Z the jail population decreased by and now take that number and multiply it by a million so what does that give me when I take the point zero zero five zero three four five thousand and thirty four uh, per year? Okay. You don't have to put the negative again because you've already indicated the negative when you write decreased. So you don't have to put minus here again. But be sure to put the per year in the average rate of change interpretation. That per year is really important, okay? Or that it could be per time period. So this could be per minute or per second. In this example, it's per year, right? So on average, from 2007 to 2010, the jail population decreased by just a tiny amount each year, right? 5,034, okay? Normally, you don't think of that in, as a tiny amount. But in terms of millions, that's a tiny amount, right? 5,034 uh, per year, okay? But again, not steady, all right, now let's look back. So I'm going to switch. Uh, uh, I've got another example here, but I'm going to say that for next time. Let's look at another example, though, maybe a little bit easier. Okay. All right, so here I've got a function represented by a graph. Okay, a function represented by a graph. And here's what this function shows. All right, so it shows the distance y uh, measured in miles that a motor scooter has traveled X hours uh, into a trip, 
okay? So the motor scooter has been uh, taking a trip, okay, for X hours, and uh, so this is elapsed time again, except this time it's hours. Uh, uh, and this graph shows the, uh, uh, the miles that it has traveled, okay, uh, on this trip, okay? Of course, what do you immediately notice there about the graph? It's linear, right, okay? So we want to keep that in mind when we're answering these questions. That is linear. First thing, what is the change from x equals 0 to x equals 3? What's the change from, uh, just the change now, from x equals 0 to uh, x equals 3? Well, remember, to calculate that change, right, you're going to find f of 3, that's f of the last, right, minus f of the first, f of 0, and just calculate the difference, okay? So this is not percent change or average rate of change. This is just the change. Well, let's see. What is f of 3? Now, we don't have the formula, so we're going to have to read the graph. What does the graph show us there? 60, right, okay? So what does that tell us, by the way? What is that f of 3 telling us? Yeah, what about the scooter? It has gone what? After what? Three hours, right, okay? So that's just telling us the scooter's gone 60 miles in three hours, right? Minus f of zero. Well, the f of zero is easy to calculate. What's f of zero? Zero, right? Of course, before the scooter starts its trip, it hasn't gone anywhere, right? So it's gone zero miles. And so the change there is 60, okay? So easy to calculate, all right? Now, what's the average? Rate of change from 0 to 3, okay? What's the average rate of change from 0 to 3? Well, that should be easy to calculate also, right? Okay, since we've already calculated the change, then the average rate of change is just going to be that change, right? Which is 60 divided by the length of our interval. What's the length of our time interval here? 3. So, of course, we come up with what? 20. Sure, right. So, what's our interpretation? For that average rate of change, okay, so we can say on average, right, from uh, 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 x equals zero hours to x equals three hours, what the motor scooter has traveled what per hour, right? Be sure to throw that in there, right? The motor scooter has traveled 20 miles per hour, okay? So in this case, the average rate of change is telling us something about the speed of that motor uh, uh, scooter, right? Over the first three hours the motor scooter was going, on average, 20 miles per hour, right? Okay. <clears throat> well, look now, what about the average rate of change from x equal 3 to x equal 5? Now, you really don't have to do any additional work here, okay, to calculate this average rate of change in this case, this is not like that previous problem where we had to go through all those calculations again for the jail population. I've changed the time interval here, but now to calculate the average rate of change, I don't have to do any extra work because this function was what? A what? Linear, linear right. Okay. And for linear functions, the average rate of change is always the same as the what? S slope, right? And for a linear function, the slope is always what? S I'm trying to say it there. Help me get it out. Begins with an S. For a linear function, the slope is always <laughs> steady. Yeah, steady, right, okay? For a linear function, the slope is always steady, right? Those are the three things I want you to... Keep in the back of your mind, right? For a linear function, average rate of change is the slope. For linear function, slope is steady. So if I ask you what's the rate of change, what's the average rate of change from x equal 3 to x equal 5, you don't have to do any more work, right? Because you know, oh, the average rate of change is the slope, and for a line, the slope is steady. So we're going to come up when we do this calculation, no matter how many times we do it, we're always going to end up with what? 20. Sure, right, okay? We're always going to end up there with 
20, okay, right, okay, because that uh, 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 function was linear. This motor scooter happened to be traveling at a very steady rate, okay, very steady rate. So they had the cruise control on or something, right? They were traveling at a very uh, steady rate there of 20 miles per hour. Now, look, when you're talking about the speed of a vehicle, right, when you're talking about the speed of a vehicle, you don't answer so if someone asks you how fast were you going or how fast are you going, you don't say, oh, on average, for the first three hours, I was going 20 miles per hour, right? Or you don't say, on average, from the third hour to the fifth hour, I was going 20 miles per hour, right? When you're answering questions about your speed, right, like when the cop stops and gives you a ticket, right, okay, the cop just asks you what? Do you know what? How fast you were going. That's right. Okay. Do you know how fast you were going? The cop doesn't say, do you know how fast you were going uh, five minutes ago, right? Or do you know how fast you were going from uh, the uh, uh, fifth minute to the eighth minute, right? Or from the sixth hour to the eighth hour, right? The cop just says, do you know how fast you're going? When you answer questions about speed like this, you are interested in how fast you are going at a particular instant, right? That is what the speedometer tells you, right? It tells you how fast you are going right at that instant, correct, right? So you don't, uh, for speed, uh, uh, you don't answer a question uh, uh, on average from this uh, time period to this time period. This is how fast I'm going. You just say, oh, this is how fast I'm going right now okay so if i ask that question for the motor scooter what is the sensible answer though okay so if i say how fast was the motor scooter tra traveling exactly after one hour so if you look down at the speedometer exactly after one hour right okay what's that speedometer going to read 20 right okay because the uh, 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 the rate of change of that scooter was what now steady right the rate of change of that scooter was steady so the answer to this is obviously oh it's 20 miles per hour right okay after one hour the scooter was going 20 miles per hour after four hours same thing right okay the scooter is going 20 miles per hour okay so you see when you answer a question like a velocity question, right, you want to know what is the velocity at a particular instant, not what was the average velocity over a time interval. Well, that's pretty easy now for this scooter, okay? That's pretty easy now for the scooter, but that question is much more complicated when an object is not going at a steady rate, okay? Let's look at an example of that now, all right? So suppose now that, uh, let me put this down because I want to break it. Uh, we're a construction worker, and we are working on a, a building a high-rise. So just look downtown. There are lots of them being built, okay? And um, we uh, make this uh, mistake, for which we'll probably get in trouble. Uh, we drop the screwdriver off of the building, okay, from a height of, well, we'll figure that out in a second. All right, but from uh, uh, way up on this uh, 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 building, we drop the screwdriver. Okay, all right. And now, of course, uh, the screwdriver is going to fall, right? Okay, but what's going to happen to the speed of that screwdriver as it's dropping? It's going to increase, right? This is how gravity works, right? Okay, so objects accelerate, right, under the pull of gravity, and they actually accelerate quite rapidly. Right. Okay. So that screwdriver is going to start dropping very, very fast. Okay. Um, all right. So um, what this formula gives you, all right, is the height of that screwdriver after a given number of seconds. Okay. So it's very similar to the uh, very similar to the scooter problem. Okay. Except it's not a graph. It's a formula. Okay. So there's one difference. But it is giving you the distance that the screwdriver, uh, well, in a sense, it's giving you uh, the, uh, uh, the distance that the screwdriver has traveled. But actually, it's the height of the screwdriver after a given number of seconds. Okay. First, let's uh, do a, start with an easy problem here. Let's evaluate and interpret f of 0. So this is not a 
uh, any sort of rate of change problem. This is just evaluate and interpret f of 0. What does that mean? Oh, well, that should be pretty easy, right? If I calculate f of 0, okay, uh, not that bad of a formula. It's not a linear function, though. I want to point that out, okay? It is not a linear function because the x here is squared. So that keeps it from being a linear function. But calculating f of 0 is still pretty easy because when you plug 0 in for x, you just get 400. What is that 400 telling us? Yeah, something is 400 feet off the ground. It's obviously the screwdriver, but we have to say a little bit more. Yeah, this is the initial height of that screwdriver, okay? So that is the height that the screwdriver is dropped from. How do I know that? Because that is the height after zero seconds. Zero seconds would be right when the screwdriver is dropped, okay? So if you want to interpret this amount, you just say, oh, the initial height uh, is 400 feet, all right? Now, actually, let me show you a graph of this function, because I do have it graphed here. So here's the graph of the function okay, that I have there, the 400 minus 16x squared. Now, I want to point out that this is not the path of the screwdriver. Okay, This is not the path of the screwdriver, because the screwdriver is falling straight down. But nevertheless, this does show you, this, the graph of this function does show you the height of the screwdriver after a given number of seconds. So when does the screwdriver hit the ground? We can read it very easily from the graph. What? Five seconds right, okay? Because at five seconds, the height is zero, you see, okay? So the screwdriver is going to hit the ground after five seconds. See, uh, the screwdriver uh, really doesn't take very long to hit the ground, okay? It's traveling really very fast. And uh, so you don't want to be uh, standing underneath that screwdriver when it hits the ground, okay? Because uh, it's going to hurt, all right? The initial height of the uh, screwdriver, what we just calculated, 400 feet. That's the height after zero seconds, okay? All right, now, uh, let's do one more simple evaluation, and then we'll be done. And then I'll tell you the problem that we're trying to figure out, okay? So let's also evaluate f of 3. That should be easy, right? So f of 3 is going to be just, what, uh, 400, right, minus 16 times 3 squared. So what is that? 256, okay? So what does that tell us? That's easy now. That tells us after 3 seconds, right? Okay, after 3 seconds, the height of the screwdriver is 256 feet. I can spell screwdriver. The height of the screwdriver is 256 feet. All right, so all that's pretty simple. But now here's what I want to know. So here's what I'm getting at. So this is what we're going to take up next time. Here's what I'd like to know. If I had a uh, speedometer attached to that screwdriver, so let's just do a little thought experiment here. If I had a, 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 a speedometer attached to that screwdriver, here's what I want to know. How fast is that screwdriver dropping exactly after three seconds? So exactly after three seconds, right there, when it's at 256, does that look like 256? Yeah, pretty close, right? So right there, after three seconds, we know it's dropped 256 feet. But I want to know what would that speedometer read on that screwdriver, okay? What would that speedometer tell me? Okay, see what's hard about this compared to the scooter problem is the screwdriver is not falling at a steady rate, is it? Okay, that's not the way objects fall, right? Okay, they don't just float at a steady rate to the ground. What happens to them as they're dropping? They pick up speed, that's right. That's how gravity works, okay? So as the screwdriver is dropping, it's getting faster and faster. So at first, the screwdriver's not dropping very fast, but then it begins to speed up, 
and when it hits the ground, it's really going very fast, okay? So I don't have a steady speed here for this screwdriver. How in the world can I figure out how fast it was going after three seconds, okay? How can I possibly do that, all right? Ah, that's where calculus starts, okay? That's exactly what we're going to figure out, though, okay? How fast was that screwdriver dropping after three seconds? Too bad this isn't a straight line, right? Because if that was a straight line, what would I just have to do? Match the yeah, uh, well, yeah, so, yeah, draw a straight line between the two points, right, okay? But to find how fast the screwdriver was dropping, I would just calculate what? The what? Slope, Slope right, yeah. That slope would tell me how fast that screwdriver is dropping, right? And that would be steady, correct? But darn it, not a straight line. See, it's a curve here. That screwdriver is picking up speed. So right after three seconds, how in the world can I figure that out? I might be able to estimate it, but how can I figure it out really exactly, okay, confidently, all right? Now, that's what we're going to take up next time, okay? But here's the thing you want to remember. It would be really nice if that curve were what? Yeah, if that rate of change were steady. In other words, if this curve were a straight line. Now you're thinking, okay, Dr. Wall, that's all wishful thinking. How am I going to make that into a straight line? Hmm, I think we can, though. Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right, so remember, your quiz is due tomorrow, and then you've got another homework due Monday. All right. It's all about change, so you're ready for that. I have a really cheap calculator. Mm -hmm. so you know that problem that we did? Um, 8.132 minus 8.147 mm -hmm. divided by 3. Oh, well, that's wrong. See, it only goes up to that. Oh, I think point. you can... I think you can get it, though, to show you more decimal places. Oh, okay, okay. But that's what... Yeah, look you're gonna have manual. to. Yeah, you're gonna have to look at the manual and get it to show you more decimal places. Okay. You want it to fill up a screen with decimal yeah, places, and it will sure. do that. Okay, I just wanted yeah, to make right. sure because I know okay. that you had 34 like factors, so I only got that, so I don't know if mm -hmm. I'm gonna test. Yeah, there's a way to change the um, settings so you can get a full number of decimal places there. So yeah, if you look at the manual, see if there's something about the yes, number sir. of decimal places, because uh -huh. it will it will print out a up, up, up. yeah it will print okay. out a full okay. display of decimal places. Yes, there. sir. Yeah. All right, okay. good to go. Thank All you right. so much.